Welcome back to Inside City Hall. After officially announcing his intention to become the next mayor of New York, Andrew Yang hit the campaign trail and crisscrossed the city with stops in the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. And Yang rolled out his agenda that includes an idea that earned him national recognition during the primary for president, a basic income program, which he says would be the largest in our country's history. With just five months to go before the Democratic primary, we've got a lot to talk about. So Andrew Yang joins me live to discuss his campaign. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you, Errol. It's so great to be here. New York City. Sounds like let's fun. Let's get back on our feet. It's been a very hard time. Okay, let's get some of the, the shade out of the way. Some of your opponents <laughs> are strongly suggesting that you're running for mayor as a, quote, backup plan after dropping out of the race for president. What is your answer to that? Well, I am so proud of the fact that we got Trump out of there and I campaigned for Joe and Kamala uh, in Pennsylvania and other swing states. And I'm thrilled that we won the Senate. How many New Yorkers right now are still pumped that we're demoting Mitch McConnell to the minority and promoting Chuck Schumer to Senate Majority Leader? So the, the, the fact that I could help make those races possible was only because I ran for president and it amassed enough of a following where I thought I could make a difference. Uh, were you, uh, you were rumored to be in line for a position in the Biden administration. Is that true? And, and if so, uh, why aren't you uh, packing your bags for DC? We did have talks. Uh, th those talks actually concluded when I told them, look, I'm so thrilled to be considered, but I'm going to head in another direction to New York City. Uh, but I have many friends in the administration, and I dare say that my connections with the president-elect and the vice president-elect and the, and the incoming secretary of transportation are going to be really good for New York. Because the fact is, New York has been sending $25 billion a year to the federal government, more than it's been receiving. And we have to let people know that there is no national recovery without New York City recovering. We have to get D.C. to see that light and hopefully send aid to the state and the city. OK, um, behind all that shade that some of your opponents were throwing at you today is a serious question. And I want to ask it my way. A lot of the biggest problems facing the next mayor actually developed over years or even decades. And there are a lot of officials and advocates and concerned citizens who have been trying to deal with homelessness and criminal justice reform and public education and economic growth and all kinds of other issues. So when they say, where has Andrew Yang been all of this time? What do you say back? Well, I say I've been in New York uh, getting married, having kids. Uh, I'm a public school parent. And I think, Errol, you're suggesting that my voting record in New York uh, has not extended to the local races. And I am part of the 87% of New Yorkers who've taken our city government for granted during good times. I have a feeling that does not apply to the folks who watch you. I think the folks who are watching you are clued in and, and probably have been much more uh, uh, participating in local politics. But this is a crisis. We all need to step up. New Yorkers uh, need to get engaged. And I think I can help us get out of this crisis. Now, on this whole question of staying in one's vacation home as opposed to your apartment in Hell's Kitchen, um, as mayor, if you're elected, well, would you, you know, a year from now, you'd be the mayor. Uh, would you urge people who could make the same choice that you made to come back to the city? No, I would. And the, the fact is, People are making these decisions in different ways every single day, Errol, and we have to make it an easy and clean call to live, to have your kids go to school right here in New York City. And we can all see that crime is rising, homelessness is a growing crisis, and families are going to make this call for themselves. So the best thing a mayor can do to keep people here in New York is to clear out any of the, the obstacles to their staying and make it clear that this is the place to be. The next mayor, I mean, the, the, the backdrop to all of this is, uh, of course, the pandemic. Uh, the next mayor will still be dealing with the problems related to it uh, and will probably still be dealing with uh, vaccine distribution, right? Is the, is the current distribution system working as far as you're concerned? And if not, what would you do differently? It seems like this vaccine rollout is not going nearly as well as it should, Errol, in part because the city and the state seem to be on, on different pages. But one thing I'm going to suggest to the people watching this right now, when are we going to feel safe having people go to a theater and go to Broadway shows? And what is the vaccination rate going to be at that point? The fact is New York City needs to do more than just wait for this vaccine rollout to be successful. We need to lead. We need to make it so that you can verify that you've been vaccinated just on your smartphone. And then if you get hundreds of people who are able just to say, I've been vaccinated, then you can go into that Broadway theater or the restaurant or the bar and know 
that everyone there has been vaccinated. New York has to be the reason why people are actually getting vaccinated and can verify it. We can't just wait for this to happen. Um, the, the other part of the crisis, of course, is a fiscal crisis. We've got a budget crunch uh, that includes, according to the mayor, a, a $10.5 billion deficit. What would you do to, um, to cut it, to save it, to, to fill that deficit hole? We're going to have to make a lot of very, very difficult choices. I think we're going to be able to find some inefficiencies in our city agencies and government that will give us some of that, let's say, $5 billion a year. But the city is also going to need to generate revenue in different ways. And I've got one idea on how we can generate millions of dollars very quickly. There are a number of large landowners in New York City who are tax exempt and property taxes are the main source of revenue, most durable source of revenue for the city. So we need to go to some of those tax exempt entities and say, look, you're enjoying fire and police uh, department services and we are seeing absolutely nothing in the way of taxes. So to use an example, Columbia University buys an apartment building, faculty move in, but all of a sudden the city's not receiving any property taxes because Columbia bought it. That's not right for New York. Columbia and other institutions that are benefiting from city services should pay something closer to their fair share. We can generate tens, even hundreds of millions of dollars if some of these organizations do so. MSG enjoys a multi-million dollar tax break that makes no sense. Yeah, MSG is an, an egregious case, and that was a special carve out that they get. But with regard to, say, ed educational institutions like Columbia and NYU and who knows how many other uh, colleges you may be talking about, uh, those kind of town gown uh, fights go on all over the country. What normally happens in, 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 uh, is that you work out some arrangement. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about changing state law? I don't know how you would do it, but uh, changing the law so that they would lose the exemption? I think people sense that I'm a collaborative guy and my preference would be to get them to the table and say, look, you're having a free ride enjoying these city services uh, and you need to pay your fair share. So that would be my first move before heading to the, the state house or the legislature. OK, I mean, you know what their answer would be is that like, you know, we're, we're paying uh, the, the income of thousands or tens of thousands of employees. Uh, and they make they help make this city go, meaning you're getting it on the backside through income taxes and 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 other uh, you know sales taxes and other revenue. I am I am very very confident that they could pay for city services and employ those people. Mm -hmm. Okay, stand by. We've got more to talk about. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with mayoral candidate Andrew Yang. Stay with us. Welcome back to Inside City Hall. I'm joined once again by Andrew Yang, who just yesterday officially announced his bid to become the next mayor of New York City. And uh, Andrew Yang, you said that you're a collaborative kind of guy. The next mayor of New York, like all the others, has to negotiate with state legislators and with Governor Cuomo in particular. Uh, what would you do that's different from the approach that Bill de Blasio used? Well, I want to be a partner to the governor uh, in getting the appropriate level of aid from the feds. And I, I think I could help. I've literally got uh, the vice president's number, <laughs> like, like a lot of other people's numbers, or the incoming vice president elect. I don't have Pence's number, uh, thank goodness. Um, so I want to be a partner to the state. As you just said, Errol, uh, there's going to need to be some collaboration, particularly because a lot of the big problems that we want to solve here in New York City, we need the state buy in. And one thing I said this morning when I declared, I think New York City needs to control its subways and buses to control its own destiny. And that's going to be one of the big things I go to Albany with. Uh, a new mayor typically gets a few big things done, uh, and we need to get at least a few things on the table in Albany to be able to move the city in, a right, in the right direction. Um, uh, another um, city-state issue came up today. The state attorney general has announced a new lawsuit against the NYPD and is calling for a monitor to oversee how the department handles protests in particular. Do you agree with that move? I have not read the lawsuit, but we can all see exactly what spurred the attorney general to bring uh, that suit. I'm looking forward to seeing the details. Uh, we all know that we have to do a couple things at once right now where the NYPD is concerned. We need to try and address the rising rates of crime that are of great concern to many of the New Yorkers I talk to. But we also have to make sure that they are not uh, 
abusing our civil rights. And I appreciate the fact that the attorney general is being mindful of the second and trying to, to bring in the federal government. Mm. Your, your, your website um, in the criminal justice section calls for expanding violence interruption programs, but that was a strategy tried by the de Blasio administration. It didn't stop the shooting rate from doubling. It didn't stop the surge in homicides. Is that still something you think should be used as a strategy? Well, I think we have a, a crisis in terms of public safety and we need to use different tools. So certainly to me, violence interrupters have demonstrated efficacy in many different environments and it's common sense where if you have a situation that could become violent, having people there to defuse it can often help. But are there other occasions when police are exactly the, the people you need? Of course. Mm -hmm. So we're going to need to attack the problem with multiple tools. And one thing I think New Yorkers will appreciate about me is I'm not particularly ideological. I'm very, very practical uh, and solutions oriented. So if something's going to work, we're going to put it to use and not pretend that the other things don't work as well. Well, what's your feeling about the uh, current leadership of the NYPD and would you keep the current leadership of the NYPD? No, I haven't had a chance to sit down with the current commissioner, but one thing I will say is I believe that the NYPD could use a civilian commissioner. Uh, and this is something we see very clearly at the national level with the federal government, where you have a civilian leader of the military. I think that having a commissioner that's independent from the culture of the police department would give that commissioner a better read on how to help the police department both do its job effectively, and also help reform the department to avoid some of the abuses we've seen. Oh, interesting. Uh, on another uh, criminal justice question. Do you support the closing of Rikers Island and the transition that this mayor has started to smaller borough-based facilities? And, wh and what would you say to people who think that that's not worth spending $10 billion on? We are in a crisis. I 100% endorse the vision of closing Rikers Island, but I think we have to be open-minded and flexible on that time frame, because we may not have the resources to close it on the timeline that was proposed. I believe that it, it was uh, five or six years from now. And over the next five or six years, we're going to be struggling with a host of issues. Mm -hmm. So yes, Rikers Island should be closed, but we need to be flexible on the timeline. Um, let's let's get to uh, your signature proposal. Uh, your proposal for a, a basic income for some New Yorkers would provide $2,000 per year or even more to lower income New Yorkers. Would the use of those funds be limited in any way or is that just a, a check for them to use however they want? Well, we're looking to wed the New York City ID with this basic income to lift people out of extreme poverty here in New York City. And one thing that I'd like to see happen is to have those resources flow directly into small businesses that are struggling to stay open, especially locally owned women and minority owned businesses in our communities. I think most people know that I'm a cash guy, like a cash relief guy. I helped champion uh, the not just the $600 checks that people are getting, but the $2,000 um, a month checks that uh, it looks like may be coming our way. But given the size of New York's economy, I think we can be creative about putting money to work in ways that actually serves multiple goals and stays in communities. And I'm going to give an example that may be close to home for some of the folks who are watching. Yeshiva schools in Brooklyn have parents spend $2,500 on essentially local business vouchers that they then use on local businesses. And then the local businesses get money from the school, but then there's a discount involved. There's a big fundraiser for yeshiva schools. I think there are things that we can do like that uh, in neighborhoods that help the resources flow through multiple times. Mm. There, there was a version of, uh, of, of cash grants that was tried by the Bloomberg administration where they conditioned it on uh, the re recipient family doing certain things, like showing up at PTA meetings or you know, proving that the kid read a few books or something like that. That's what I was uh, so, sort of getting at. Is, is the idea to, you know, I understand at a national level, the, the basic Keynesian idea of just put money into the economy, put it into the system, prime the pump, and, and, and get uh, people's lives on track. Uh, but when, when it's been tried here in the city, it, it kind of stumbled a little bit when you try to condition it on certain kinds of behavior. No, my inclination would not be to try and tie it to certain forms of behavior, which I think is very difficult in terms of monitoring and administration. It would be tying it to where it's used. You know, if you're going to use these these funds at a local mom and pop business that right now is uh, on the verge of, of closing, 
then there's not much you could do in that store that anyone would have a problem with. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if, if you're going into that that grocery store. So I'm more concerned about the destination of the money in terms of what type of establishment and whether that money stays right here in New York City than I am in trying to administer particular behaviors. Well, yeah, I mean, but that, that's my point, is that if, if, if people, you know, if they want to, they could go to, you know, Atlantic City and the whole $2,000 is gone in a weekend. Yeah, and, and so we have some... Uh, some proposals that I think are going to excite people around trying to make sure that the money stays right here in New York City. The great thing about New York City is that if we were a country, we would be the, the 11th biggest economy in the world. We can do some things to keep the money right here in New York City that will improve people's lives. But we are in a crisis where I think we're going to have to do multiple things at once. I was joking with someone, Errol, that, that this job, this next mayor is going to have at least three things in front of them. They're going to need to make some very, very difficult decisions about where we have to cut back. They're going to have to do more with less. And then they're going to have to activate resources in new and innovative ways. Uh, you need to do all three. Okay. Oh, let me ask you about education. Your business background was as the operator of a, te of a testing company. What role do you think testing companies have played in the trend toward uh, segregation in the gifted and talented programs and the specialized high schools? I think most people recognize that at this point, the standardized tests uh, reward families that have the means to prepare their kids. Uh, and it, it's one reason why many people are frustrated. I think that the SHSAT, as an example, should be used as a data point. But you know what else should be used as a data point? Academic record, interviews, the child's background and, and experience. We can have more holistic reviews of our children, and I'm a parent, I've got two kids. Can you imagine as a parent thinking that one test actually determines what school a, a child should go to or what would be the right fit? Uh, I think we can actually broaden the criteria that we use. I would not abandon the SHSAT, but I would broaden the criteria we're using. And I think if we do that, we can actually get some of the families into these specialized high schools in a way that's going to, to benefit them and the city. Okay, and, and then uh, finally, uh, are there any New York City mayors, living or dead, that you would look to for inspiration? I mean, folks are gonna try and get a, uh, they've got a broad field to look at, and uh, a lot of the viewers are gonna try and figure out what kind of a mayor would an Andrew Yang be? Anybody uh, around the country or former New York mayors that you look to for inspiration? You know when the first thing you see, and that just becomes that thing in your mind. For me, the first mayor I remember as a child was Ed Koch's smiling face on my TV uh, saying, I love New York, or how am I doing? Uh, you know, and at least for me, and I was quite young at that time, I had this very, very positive feeling about Mayor Koch. He made me feel good. Uh, I want to be the kind of mayor that helps New Yorkers feel good about the direction that we are heading right now. We need a different type of leadership because this is an unprecedented crisis. Uh, and the folks that stewarded us through this 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 crisis, in my vision, in my experience, not very successfully, are not the right people to lead us out. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. We'll wish you the best of luck, and we'll see you out on the campaign trail. Andrew Yang, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Errol. Appreciate oh, you. You got it. Put the money in our hands. 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 Can we afford it? Yes. Will it cause inflation? Is it awesome? Yes. Is anyone trying to make it happen? Yeah, that guy.